Okay, welcome everyone. We're doing another uh, presentation today, and this came at a perfect time. Uh, we've been thinking about ways to getting new members and introducing the club to new people, and, and the whole time Stephen's joining our, our, our club and our hobby right beneath our noses because every Sunday we saw him out at Kennedy, and he, uh, his play, he was part of the Whippet gang. They kind of invaded uh, the DLG gang, and uh, now DLG sort of seems kind of kind of large and uh, not quite as cool. But uh, uh, Stephen brought out his son, Michael, and they were playing with Whippets and the new, some new generation of planes. And Noel was quite helpful in getting them tuned into the sport. But uh, the, the reason why I thought it was such an opportune time for him to speak is uh, he has a new view, a view of what it's like to get back into the hobby. And I, you'll explain how you, maybe that, you got in it years ago. But with a son, I think a lot of us get into the hobby. And he can explain how. Uh, you know, how the, the challenges, the hurdles, and how he learned about us, and how he learned about the hobby. And so we're just really glad that you offered to talk, and uh, let's give him a little welcome. Thank you. And now if you need a slide check. Sure, we will do. Um, I prepared this in part for your entertainment, but also with a longer goal of putting something together that we can post on the club website that can be a guide for uh, newbies who really don't know what to do, what direction to go in, how to get started, and uh, may even be a little intimidated to ask. Uh, I can tell you that I can be a little bit intimidated when I'm in this room and recognize the uh, amount of experience and expertise that you all have, uh, which I don't. Uh, so some of the things you're going to see here are things, you know, you know, they're common sense things, but things that I didn't know and that someone entering the hobby should know. So let's go start with the first slide. Okay, so why get back into model sailplane soaring? Um, back in high school, 1970, I became interested in RC airplanes. I'm not exactly sure. I had a friend whose father was in the local club, and I think that's how I got interested in it. Uh, next. Uh, yeah, so I joined the local club. This was in Endicott, New York. It was all IBM engineers with uh, short sleeve white shirts, black ties, and black horn glasses. And black socks. And black socks. <laughs> a lot of white socks, too. And pocket protectors. Pocket protectors. It just everything you can imagine. And we met in the basement of one of their engineering buildings. Uh, once a month, and it was amazing for me to see what these people were producing at that time, just exquisitely made balsa planes. The one that comes to mind immediately was this Fokker D7 that uh, someone had made. It was just stunning, just beautiful. So I was really taken by it. Um, next, please. Uh, but there was the whole cost issue. that. At that time, the cost of a plane was put into a Fender Stratocaster, which was my other dream. You know, both of them equally unattainable. Uh, you really, you, you probably don't remember the kind of investment that had to be made back then just to get into the sport. Next. So uh, I got my first and last RC plane, which was given to me out of pity. Um, one button transmitter for rudder only. Does anybody remember that? Okay. Yeah. Which worked great until it flew off and never came back. And that was kind of the end of my RC career. And then in 71 we moved to Rochester, New York and kind of fell out of the whole RC thing. Thanks. So, fast forward 46 years, uh, I'm looking on the internet for something to do one weekend and I see uh, something on a website about uh, a radio control event in Portola. And I thought, well, that sounds kind of interesting. Uh, I'd like to go see that. Because okay. uh, I, and I really hadn't thought about soaring before. My only experience was with power flight and the idea of soaring was kind of intriguing to me because it was a, a new area and uh, I really didn't know how to approach it because how do you get the plane up there and how do you keep it up there? This didn't make sense, yes? 
you lived in Endicott. Why the heck didn't you go to Elmira there yourself? Well, I, you know, I, Elmira was a, a good haul away, and mm -hmm. my parents weren't all that interested in me, you know, <laughs> <laughs> getting interested in an expensive hobby at that time. But yeah, Elmira is a great soaring capital. Next? Uh, yeah, but the thing that really shocked me was just how much things had changed, which shouldn't have surprised me, but it, it really, I had no idea what the whole hobby had turned into. Uh, so I was waking up, and I had to start catching up, and that mean, meant making mistakes. And what I'm going to talk about today is mostly the mistakes I made, the rookie mistakes I made that someone, that I wish I hadn't made, and if I had thought to ask, um, wouldn't have made probably. But uh, let's go and start with the first one. So let's have the changes. Okay, planes, inexpensive comparatively. I mean, you can get a ready to fly phony with the transmitter for under $100. Uh, just shocking. Yeah. Uh, and of course, computerized transmitters. I mean, I'm still stunned at the power that these things contain, what you can do with them. Uh, and phone construction, you know, this kind of revolutionized the uh, field, even though it's got its downsides, it's definitely got its upsides, especially for beginners, people just getting into the hobby. Next. And electric power. My God. I still have a scar from my Cox 049. <laughs> and uh, the idea that you could just flip a switch and, and have the, the propeller running is really surprising. I guess I didn't really think that it would be even possible to get enough power into a battery to lift a glider substantially into the air. But I was wrong. So where do I start? Mistake number one, wrong plane. Mm -hmm. I, I, I went right to the internet, of course, and uh, saw a plane and said, oh, okay, that looks good, but that should be easy to fly. Uh, no idea what was involved, whether it was suitable for a beginner or suitable for anyone for that matter. Uh, but how hard could it be? You look at the videos, there, people are flying them, they doing loops and all kinds of things. It's great. So I bought a foam VTEL glider. Uh, and only two attempts to destroy it. I think that's something of a record. <laughs> so, and I, I really did think that they set these things up correctly at the factory. I, it never occurred to me that I should see if, you know, you push the stick down, does the elevator go in the right direction or not. And uh, it turned out that it didn't, which <laughs> substantially contributed to my failure to fly it correctly. So that was kind of depressing. What was it? Um, it was a uh, FMS VTAIL glider. It was a, one of these $99 things where you get the cheapo transmitter and everything in one piece. And mistake. But then I got good advice from Noel. Get a whip it. And I've also got a UMX in there. Absolutely the best starter plane anyone new to the hobby should start with one of these. Uh, I, I still can't get over the design. So simple, but they pack not just the servos in there, but also you know room for the, this tiny battery. It, they, you can have replacement parts, which you will definitely need. Even if you destroy the entire plane, you know, it's not expensive to replace. And it gives you the opportunity to learn every fundamental aspect of flying. There's, and not only that, you can actually learn some advanced aspects of flying. You can you know, get close to thermaling these things reasonably well. And uh, my son Michael just became practically an expert at flying these things. Very, very good start. So, Lesson one, got to whip it, go on. Next. Uh, problems with where to get good advice, this is where I would recommend people go to if they're new to the hobby. Of course, RC Groups is one place to go. 
And then I've also listed some uh, other websites here uh, just with basic information. I'd like, this is the kind of thing, if you're starting out, you don't really know where to go. You want to get some, some good, unbiased, experienced information. The best place to go, of course, would be the club itself. And that's what we want people to do. We want, we want them to come here and feel comfortable asking questions, know who to ask, and not be intimidated by you know, your high level of expertise, which I found really intimidating, to be honest. And still do. I mean, I, I look at that, that wing, that Kyle made, I think, man, that's, I can't even imagine doing something like that. So, you know, why would Kyle talk to me <laughs> I'm just, I'm about something dumb? Like, cool. <laughs> okay, next. Uh, second mistake, I bought the wrong transmitter. Because when I bought the Whippet, I wanted to buy the cheapest transmitter that would work with the Whippet. And that was a big mistake. Next. Uh, I had no idea what features I would need down the road. I didn't know how I could justify the cost of purchasing a more expensive transmitter right off the bat. Next. Uh, but I was very soon to learn that I would really need those features and want them. Uh, if I had known that at the beginning, I would have bought the right one. And, I, and of course, you can always sell it on eBay if you decide that the hobby is not for you. So, advice. You will learn that you need the features that are in the better transmitter, uh, the, the ability to select models, save models in memory, uh, set up the servo properly, the reversal flight modes, all that kind of stuff. Seemed very esoteric to me at the beginning, and then I quickly learned that it's really quite necessary. Um, Spectrum DX6, because it's compatible with the Whippet and can take you, as far as I can tell, as far as I'm going to need to go. I'm sure that, that there are some people who that would not be an adequate transmitter, but I think for the starting pilot, uh, it will probably last them a good number of years. Um, and I'd say, if you don't stick with the hobby, there's always eBay. You can uh, sell it and probably get not too much less than what you paid for it. Okay. Uh, then there's the stuff I didn't know you need. Like mm -hmm. a battery charger. Uh, and then, oh boy, the, the portable battery tester. I learned that one just recently. Um, I didn't realize you actually had to check your battery once in a while because they don't Aren't they supposed to last forever for the time that you're flying? They, they're supposed to know when you're done? And, but no, no, the batteries, you have to check them. So I learned the hard way that uh, you need one of those. And then there's the whole battery thing. It's like cells and light bulb. I thought that was weight loss surgery. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, you know, and then the voltages, you know, the, the, the servos and the Transmitter or receiver expect one voltage, but the battery's giving another. And then if you have the two cells, it's twice. And it took me a real while to get my head wrapped around the whole battery thing. And uh, there was this, I put a site on here, a link to a site that actually has a very good introduction to uh, battery technology. Hot glue gun, couldn't live without my hot glue gun. Uh, and of course, all the other glues that go with it. And then there's just too many. There's too many things. But you have to be mentally prepared, I think, at, when you're entering the hobby, to know that there's going to be these expenses. There's, you're going to need to spend money on stuff other than the plane and the transmitter. You know, there, there will come a time where you, you're well um, supplied and that you don't really need to buy that much more. But there's going to be that initial period where you're buying uh, tools for repair. Uh, maybe for building, if you're going to get into building, that kind of thing. And I was really unprepared for the amount of uh, equipment that I would need to get. Okay, next. Okay, another mistake, rushing to the next plane. I, I really wanted to get into a better plane. I was flying this little whip it. I felt wimpy. I wanted you know, a real little plane. Uh, and that was really dumb, because until you can master the essentials of flying, you know, rather an elevator, but on a it, you really can't expect that you're going to be ready to move up to the next plane. Um, and I bought planes that I shouldn't have, 
and I wrecked them, and I wasted money, and it was dumb, dumb, dumb. Um, but I'm an impatient person by my nature, and I've paid for it many times in other ways. Um, but let that be a lesson for others that don't be in too much of a hurry. You can learn so much with a simple plane uh, before you move up to something different. Next. So the lesson, take your time. Uh, don't think about moving up until you can land that plane safely every time. Uh, when you fly it perfectly, you can consider moving up. And then the important thing is, what's the next plane? What are the what choices, what effort will be involved? What are you ready for for the next plane? So in, so in a lot of ways, the second plane is the much more critical decision than the first one. The first one is easy. You get to whip it. The second one, there's a lot more choices involved, more thought involved. Yeah. Almost ready to fly. Almost ready to what? Yeah, I, that was part of the problem I, I got is I believed that when they told me almost ready to fly. I, I thought almost meant like almost. You're, <laughs> you're, you get it and you, know, you have to do a few things and then you're ready to fly. Um, there's a broad range of interpretation of the meaning of the word almost. And you have to be careful about that because you can get in over your head very quickly uh, with a plane that requires more assembly than you're prepared to do, uh, or involves some weird, funky stuff that should never have been designed into a, a plane in the first place. Um, and the thing I'm thinking of immediately is the <clears throat> Great Plains Fling DLG, which is only a DLG to the extent that it has a peg in the wing. And it, the rudder control, control has this weird thing where you have to put a, a plastic tube into the uh, stabilizer, and then you run the, the thread through the tube, and it comes out the back side, and it's like, I wasn't ready for that. I don't think anyone's ready for that, frankly. <laughs> um, so let's go on to the, the next slide. Build information. Look on YouTube. There's any plane that's been around for a while will typically have build information either on YouTube or RC groups, and you get a heads up on what's involved in actually putting the plane together. Uh, downloading the instruction in advance if possible. Ask for advice. What do people think would be good planes? And in general, if a model's been around for a while, it's probably going to be uh, a reasonable candidate for you to choose from. I, in the, the models that have been around, you know, you, you don't have to look too far to find, you know, a gentle lady or something like that, something that you can either build relatively easy or is put together mostly and you can uh, do it on your own. Next. Yeah, and then, then there's the whole fear of crashing thing. Um, wow. I mean, those first few crashes were really, really depressing. And it took me a while to realize that that's part of it. You have to expect it, and it's not usually nearly as bad as you think it is. It's worse. <laughs> in some cases, it is. But in many cases, you know, the first time you see a broken wing or a broken fuselage, you just think, oh my god, I've just thrown away this money. You take out the hot glue gun and whatever, and you put it back together, and you know it still flies. And then if it gets to a point where it doesn't, then you know you move on. But the point is that you can't avoid it. It's a, it's an unavoidable uh, part of the process. Next, so everyone crashes. You will crash your plane. Experienced pilots crash. They mostly look worse than they are and are repairable. And it's a learning experience. It's, the, this hobby is, is not something I found out that you walk into and everything just happens. It's not like you know going to a flight simulator and just you know oh okay I can do loops and all this kind of stuff. And that's of course what makes the hobby interesting. If it were easy, why would anybody want to do it? It's the endless challenge. Is what I've learned in the year that I've been involved in the club. It's the endless challenge that makes it something that you want to stick with. The challenge of better design, 
better understanding of how to fly, you know, uh, understanding thermals and wind patterns and things like that, that just make it uh, something that you can never stop growing in. So part of that is crashing, and it, it diminishes, it, it gets better uh, with time, and that is, and sure has for me. Yeah? Uh, okay, so we don't want to make the wrong next plane. Um, I got some real losers, ask for vices, what are we done with the previous slides, but let's continue. So what do you want to do for a step up plane? And my advice would be continue with the rudder elevator model and just get to a bigger plane. Um, and gentle lady, you, everyone here I'm sure is more than familiar with that as a good beginning model. Um, I was impatient. I didn't want to have to build something, although now I'm kind of interested in want to do that. So I bought this uh, Hobby King Dynamo, which turns out to be a very, very good plane. And so I'm staying in the same general skill area, just moving up to a, a larger plane that will require a little more uh, skill to to master and also brings you into the high start mode so you're actually getting more altitude on your launch, you're getting longer flights and uh, just building up your confidence and your skill level. This by the way is this, the second dynamo, the first one, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> and a, a funny thing about it is um, this, this is from Hobby King and they have the weirdest pricing fluctuations. <laughs> and the first one I bought was around $90 when that one was gone and I went to replace it, it was $50. Terrific, I should have bought four of them probably. <laughs> and when I went there last week and it's $150. So I don't know how that happens or what, what their algorithm is, but it's a little bizarre. But that's actually a, a very, very good plane if you don't want to build one yourself. Next. This is a great plane. This is uh, the Great Plains Fling. Totally unrelated to the Fling DLG. They bear no resemblance to each other. They just use the name twice. Um, <laughs> I was flying this, yes, it was yesterday, right? Right, Kennedy? Monday. Was it Monday? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think we track of time. Yeah. And it's great. The thermals, it's responsive, uh, easy to put together, uh, durable small, easy to, to take from place to place, a great second plane. Next. Uh, if you want to get more in, is into the DLG uh, mode, this is one I got recently on a whim, kind of, uh, the Hobby King Raven. It's a nice little plane. It's uh, aileron and elevator only. There's no rudder control. Comes with the uh, aileron servos installed and connected Super simple build. <clears throat> All you do is uh, screw on the uh, elevator stabilizer. It's got a string that connects. It's spring-loaded, so you connect the string at one end. The other end connects to the servo, which is installed. Screw on the, the wing, and you put in your uh, receiver and battery, and you're basically ready to go. Surprisingly good flyer, though. It launches quite high. It has a decent glide path. I prefer to use this at Mission Peak. I like to fly DLG up at Mission Peak because I like to get that extra height, especially if it's a day without a lot, a lot of lift. You know, I can still have a satisfying flight without uh, a lot of lift if I take uh, this with me or the Lavelle. Okay, next. Okay, um, if you want to go into power, I don't need to tell anybody here that the radium is the perfect way to go, easy to fly, great design. Uh, um, you can't go wrong with the radium if that's where you want to go. Uh, next. And here's my, my personal favorite. Um, I've labeled it the War Horse, um, and I brought it with me for you to examine just how uh, this plane can endure anything if enough hot glue is applied. 
It's, it's, it's a good one for learning DLG. It's not a great DLG flyer, but it's good for learning because it's got all the controls in a long run elevator. Uh, it launches okay. It's not great, but it launches okay. And you know, you can get used to those fundamental aspects of control. Um, love it up at Mission Peak. This is, sometimes I go up there, I don't always go with two planes. And sometimes I'll just fly this um, and you know, all day because it just flies so well up there. So I would, uh, one thing I think about when I think about the design of this plane is as a software engineer, one of the things you think about when you're designing an algorithm is um, um, not just how the, the algorithm works under ideal conditions, but how it works when you go away from ideal conditions. That is when you get, uh, if, if the data doesn't follow the uh, probability distribution that would be ideal, uh, what happens? Does it still perform the same way? <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, that's obnoxious. I've been plugging my car. So let's see what what I, I I always think about it. Everyone has these old planes sitting around. Did you consider uh, just asking around, seeing if you could find a, a used plane? I, I think that would be a good thing to do, and I think it would be good within the club if there was a way to, for people to to ask that. You know, just say, does anybody have a, a plane that they don't want? Um, or that sell for a minimal. Or, or right sell for whatever. Yeah. Um, Program that I set up another uh, yeah. auction. Yeah, auction. Yeah, that's auction in yeah December. We have an auction. Oh, I didn't know. There's that. kind of steals. Yeah, it's really a what reasonably priced. Okay. Swap. But but this so, would be for somebody to say. I went to January. Something you know. You're yeah. Just starting to get into it. What what have we got? What have we got? And I'm I'm sure that if the question was asked at a meeting. We probably come up with some choices. Yeah, that's probably something in general lady thing. We probably have four in this room. Yeah, yeah. Post of RC groups. Yeah. 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 I personally find RC groups a little intimidating. I don't know why. Something about the interface. I I find it difficult to navigate, and I'm always concerned about. I don't know. I I, I have issues with the website. I don't know why. But try RC Universe and then you'll think RC Groups is yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the word I was looking for is, is robustness, and that's the, the term that's used to describe how uh, any mechanism, software or hardware, functions as you move away from the ideal conditions. And uh, this plane has proved to be extremely robust. And all I had to do is add Lots of hot glue, gorilla tape, um, and it just keeps flying. I've had to replace servos and things like that, but um, I like this plane so much that I already have another one in the box at home should this one ever completely give up. But I'm hoping that it doesn't because it's, it's part of my history now, and I really love it, and I just want to keep flying it. Uh, the plane, is, the wing is now permanently attached to the fuselage. It's got glued on popsicle sticks underneath, you know, to add some support. I glassed in uh, the canopy and the fuselage and then put Gorilla Tape over that. And you'd think with all of that it would, it would be terrible. No, it still flies great. Okay, next please. Okay, here's the mystery mistake. Don't know yet, don't know yet. This is the A number one most important advice that I've received since being at the club. Here it is. Wiggle, wiggle. <laughs> yes. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've forgotten that and you know destroyed planes or you know came close to it. It's such a simple thing to think about. You know, just check your control before you launch, and it's so easy to forget. But I've pretty much ingrained it in me at this point, and this is. Fundamental. I think everybody who starts in a hobby, that's one of the first things that they should be learning is always wiggle wiggle. So next. Yes, always wiggle wiggle. It takes no time. 
especially after a hard landing. Um, and it's laziness and forgetfulness that will get you on this. Next. So where do I fly? You know all these places. This would be something of interest to someone new to the area who doesn't really know where to go. Um, Kennedy, of course, Rancho, uh, Mission, my personal favorite. You know, a bad day at Mission beats a good day anywhere else. Um, Baylands, Brigantino, and my secret place, La Colina Park, uh, down where I live in the Santa Teresa area. Big park, thick grass, nobody's ever there. And on top of that, it's got a 100-foot, I would estimate, round top hill that you can go up and have a beautiful view of the uh, South Bay area. And I've flown everything there. And uh, it's closed for the summer because they're uh, renewing the turf. They're letting everything grow so that, I guess, the ground rejuvenates and then everything will be cut back. But uh, when it reopens, I will invite people to come down to La Colina Park to go flying. It's a, it's a wonderful place. I haven't been to, was it Coyote Hills? Yes. I, I really want to go there. So um, maybe sometime we can arrange to, uh, to, to be there. Uh, next. So what do I like to fly? What don't I like to fly? I love DLG. I love Slurmel. Slurmel DLG, my personal favorite, which I think I just made up. You know, take a, a DLG up to Mission and, you know, get an extra 40 feet of launch to get your plane up there. Uh, I don't worry as much about the conditions, I think, as Sean does because I never let my plane get that far out. I mean, I've seen Sean fly. I know, and Rich as well. I mean, I know what their range is like. It's like, I'm not ready for that. I, I get it, I keep it close to the hill. If it doesn't fly, I bring it back. I'm happy to just get it back in one piece. And frankly, I'm happy to just be up there. It's such a, a beautiful place to be. And it's part of my exercise regimen. Um, high start, love high start. We were out on Monday just flying high start. Um, and powered. I like that too. Um, maybe not as much, but you know that's fun to do also. Next. So, what else do I have? What else have I acquired? Let's take a look. Um, Blaster three. Whoop, yep. Blaster three. Um, my dream DLG. I love it. It's. I'm, I'm not even close to scratching the surface of what this plane is capable of doing. But uh, one thing I'd like to say about DLGs, though, in general, is that there's like the starter level, and then there's the high level. And almost anything in between is a compromise that you probably end up not being totally satisfied with. It's like, if, you don't, if you're going to do it, go to something that's good enough that you're going to be happy flying that for years to come, because anything else you probably outgrow uh, more quickly than you think. Next. Uh, love it. Our hobby, Sky 2M. This is, uh, this and the Lavelle are my two go-to planes for mission. And uh, I've only recently felt comfortable enough flying this one that I, you know, because the, the trick in mission, of course, is landing. And, you know, if you are not comfortable landing, I, I didn't want to damage this plane. But now I've gotten to the point where I feel comfortable with that. It's just gorgeous to see this thing fly. It's just so majestic. Next. Um, Noel uh, can give a little history on this. Um, this was given to me by a club member who was moving away uh, one day we were at, at Kennedy and Mission. And uh, Noel and this, uh, who was that? Noel, do you remember? Yeah, that's what I remember. Yeah, I don't even remember, but anyway, he had this plane and he wanted it to find a home. It's covered, uh, it originally was covered with this um, semi-transparent uh, covering for the entire surface, but it had become wrinkly on the wing and you couldn't really get it to be tight anymore, so I recovered the, the wing with the uh, blue cover. And it's actually, it's a decent flying plane, so I, you know, 
pretty, but it's it's fun. It's a good plane, and I enjoy flying it. Next, okay, on the power end, the uh, Phoenix 1600 it has to be the biggest bargain in the world. You can get this at Hobby King for I think 70 or 80 bucks. Ready to go. I mean, uh, receiver ready. Ready to put receivers. Got everything built into it. Flies really well. Uh, the body is um, plastic. It's form, you know, vacuum formed plastic, so it's really rugged. And uh, it's comes set up for ailerons, but it also has the cutouts, and I put flaps in it as well. Uh, glides very nicely. You can it, even when you buy it, it comes with a plain nose cone, so you can take the propeller off and just put that nose cone on there if you're going to go slope flying, which I've done, and it's pretty good at that too. So this is a great bargain, good plane, if you're going to get into power flight, it's a step above the Radian in terms of what you can do with it. Next. Uh, the Radian XL, I love this thing. It's, it's a monster, but, uh, well, it's a monster for me. I mean, other people at Gumintino have planes you know, bigger than this, but, um, Easy to fly, like any radian, big enough that with my eyes I can see it when it's up at a pretty good altitude. And I love the, uh, the spoilers, the pop-up spoilers in the wing, make it much, much easier to land. Extremely rugged, you know, just... What's the wingspan on that? Uh, 2.8, 2.8 I think, or 2.8. <laughs> I think it's 2.9, 2.8, something like that. Well, that's up to 115. And it, the wing is in three pieces. Um, it goes together very quickly, just a few screws that you just tighten to put the pieces together, and it's it's ready to go. So I enjoy this. I've flown this down at Brigantino a couple of times. Next. Oh, and this, this one I just got recently, um, the Mystique RAS. Except I'm not putting a, an engine in mine. This is a generic photo that I got off of the web. Uh, flew, flew this at Brigantino a couple weeks ago. Hit a tree. <laughs> broke a wing panel. Got the replacement wing panel. Haven't put it back together yet. Um, that tree down there, it looks like it's far away, but it's not as far as I thought it was. But it's, this is a very nice plane, very easy to put together. It, uh, the ser installing the servos for the spoilers is a little bit tricky, but not too bad. And it's, it's just a fun plane. Next. This uh, I got from Dick Rohr when uh, he was moving out of his house. Oh, my goodness. I don't know. It's called Sail Air. Mm -hmm. Anyone heard of it? Oh, absolutely. Okay. All right. I got it. You want a pleasure? Yes, I have a kit for it. Sitting in my <laughs> Seriously? Yes, I do. I'm very eager to fly this. The only thing I'm missing are the, uh, the uh, rods for supporting the wings, but I can get those uh, at some point. Uh, the K gave it to me with the uh, Futaba uh, old transmitter. It still works. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see what this is like at some point, but it's a it's a bit of a monster. Okay, it's a real floater. floater. What's that? It's a real floater. That's what he said. Oh, absolutely. That's that's pretty pretty mild. It's a monster. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't use the radio that's in it. Take it out. Use your new radio. Really? Yeah. 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 Okay. The new receiver's worth it. So yeah. You don't want to use that. Also. So in the end, was it worth it? It's my friend from Mission Peak. Well, was it? Let's find out. Yes, it was worth it. Surprise! I re reconnected with all the things that attracted me to RC flying so long ago. It was, except it's better. And SBSS is great. You guys rock. So, you know, what could be better than coming back to the hobby? Realizing that you never really left it, that was there's still part of that in you, except it's even better than it ever was, and you're with a group of people who are great and have such great expertise. And once in a while, you get to see a flying cow at the mission peak. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I do have a kit for that. 
Uh, I'm sure Walt has one too. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.